viewers, I'm your host Swati Kundra. We begin the show with the Indian economy's growth story which has been performing tremendously despite a downturn in the West. The government of India's proactive policies of attracting more investment and creating more job opportunities is bearing fruit. My colleague Chandrakala spoke to Dr. A. D. Das Singh, Secretary General of the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. Here are the experts. So, Dr. Didar Singh, welcome to our show. First of all, uh, I would like to say, like, uh, we, as we all know, that India uh, continues to maintain a trajectory growth, uh, and like somehow the growth percentage is around seven to eight percent. So, what do you have to say on this regard? I mean, what what view view you have regarding that? Please tell our viewers. You know, to understand uh, the Indian growth story, you need to look at more than just the, the GDP figures. Of course, the GDP figures are absolutely correct. You're, you just pointed out between 7 to 8 percent. In fact, whether it's World Bank, IMF, OECD, everybody's been talking somewhere in the range of 7.5, 7.6, that this for India and for the world is probably, as, as again has been reported all across of the press, that it is the single largest growth story in a large economy. So what does this actually mean? This means that both supply and demand are strong in India. We have a large market, we have a large manufacturing base, a large services base, and we have a large consumption base. So it's all kind of kicking in together, despite the situation of a global slowdown, where we know that, that, that things are not so good in many parts of the world, you know, Europe and, and, and the US itself has not been so good, and South America, and, and here we have a, a story which is strong, which is robust, and so I guess it's a special story. So it is a growth story. Okay, coming to the next question, uh, we have seen that the manufacturer sectors in India is like has been facing certain challenges in comparison to other countries. So uh, to overcome such challenges, what what major initiatives should be taken on part of the government as well as other sectors? See, we are a market economy, and in a market economy, the single largest feature of success is actually competitiveness. So anything that improves the competitiveness of doing business will lead to better business, will lead to more growth. So look at it from two angles, the government angle and the private sector angle. So far as the government angle is concerned, this whole Make in India initiative converted itself into ease of business initiative. And the important thing that has happened with the ease of business is that the 29 states of India are all now competing with each other. Each of them wants to do that much better, put out that much better government services, create that much better economic environment to attract investment. But attract investment doesn't just happen with ease of business. It happens with the entire ecosystem of a market. Am I, am I going to get sustained growth in that market? And that's where I believe private sector comes in. So private sector comes in, brings in technology, brings in money, brings in industry, manufacturing services to create an ecosystem where the market is attractive for investment both from overseas as well as internally. So it's a combination of both. Basically the word is competitiveness. Competitiveness by the government, competitiveness by, by, by the private sector, both coming in to actually contribute to the growth story. So coming to this uh, BRIC summit which uh, recently took place, uh, we have seen agreement has been signed between Russia and India. So uh, signing with uh, like signing such agreements and for the future, how, how it's going to ha like help India for the development I'm glad you've raised, the, I'm glad you've raised uh, the, the, the example I of I mean BRICS every, uh, we can see that every uh, year, or I mean every month, almost alternative months, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has taken such initiative to go, go to other places and like signing off agreements you what, know, what kind one, of one one is you know when you talk about our, our prime minister of course he has a very robust and very good foreign policy and he's connecting india to a large nations around the world and now brics is a very interesting phenomena because brics was a political phenomena it was five countries china south africa brazil russia and india coming together now let's remember that brics is not a trade agreement there's no connectivity or there's no special agreement of trade between these countries. But politically, they represent the South or they represent economies which are not part of the so-called, you know, Western or Northern economies so that, you were, that you were referring to. In that sense, 
they are large emerging economies that have a very good economic future. Now let's move to Balochistan, the largest and the resource rich province of Pakistan which is facing a major human rights crisis. The Baloch are being suppressed in the worst form of oppression. Military operations are being carried out against the civilians. We have a report. A protest outside Lahore Press Club by family members and human rights activists for the safe release of Wahid Baloch, a 52-year-old Baloch activist who has been missing from Karachi since July 26. Wahid is among many other Baloch activists who have been picked up by intelligence sleuths for demanding justice and freedom. The whereabouts of these Baloch missing persons is unknown. Several of them were killed and their mutilated bodies were found dumped in isolated places across Balochistan. According to the Voice for Baloch Missing Persons, an NGO, state authorities have admitted arrest of more than 12,000 people by law enforcement agencies in the last one and a half years in Balochistan. The disappeared people have not been brought before any judicial body as yet. Baloch diaspora has been raising the issue of state-run terror in Balochistan by holding events across Europe, Canada and the US. Recently in Brussels, France-based Baloch Voice Association raised the grim situation in Balochistan and demanded international intervention. Look how this Islamic state of Pakistan is suppressing us and how they are looting us and why they are killing our loved ones and who are they and for what what purpose they are sacrificing their lives and this thing we have mentioned in the declaration that please uh, asking the organizations particularly the red cross that uh, uh, announce the baloch uh, prisons as prisoners of war we are in a state of war with the country which has occupied our land, which is killing our people, so announce us, uh, our prisoners as prisoners of war. The atrocities on Baloch people have increased after Islamabad and Beijing signed a multi-billion dollar China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC. The people in Balochistan who are championing the cause of Free Balochistan Movement are opposing the project which they say will lead to exploitation of their resources. The situation in Balochistan is grim. To speak more about this, we are now joined by Claudia Heidelberg who recently formed an NGO in London called Friends of Balochistan. Claudia, since you have been monitoring the situation in Balochistan, what is the real picture out there? I see now the situation rising in Pakistan because of the CPIC uh, corridor, the contract between China and uh, Pakistan, uh, where China uh, yes, uh, wants Pakistan to secure the CPIC corridor. And it gives um, Pakistan all options uh, to strengthen the atrocities just uh, uh, for the gold to secure the corridor and uh, also to um, exploit the natural resources of uh, Balochistan. Do the United States and European Union need to take urgent notice of the situation in Balochistan? I think we uh, have to uh, aware the European uh, people more because it is a very unknown conflict there and uh, because of the uh, social media now uh, we can reveal more. But uh, I think it's uh, very, very difficult uh, to get people in Europe and also in US on our side because they are not all informed about. Uh, we just can put pressure on it if uh, uh, all are informed and know what happens. But I think uh, we can more strengthen our influence over the governments of the Western leaders. In Pakistan, both state and non-state actors are involved in carrying out atrocities in Balochistan. Should Pakistan be declared a terror state? I think um, that US 
must do something against the Punjabi army. The Punjabi army and also ISI is ruling. Uh, I think that Mr. Uh, Nawaz Sharif is just a puppet or has no power. And uh, I think uh, in the next months we have a change in U.S. in the elections. We must see if we can set on the president upcoming, uh, if he will change his policy. We hope the United States changes its policy towards Pakistan. Moving on, India and Nepal share unique cultural, political and social bondings. Efforts are always high on keeping the momentum intact and enhancing ties by encouraging trade and people-to-people -people contact. The recent visit of the Indian President Pranam Mukherjee to Nepal is seen as the advent of a new phase of ties between the two neighbours. Take a look. Nepal rolled out the red carpet for Indian President Pranam Mukherjee, who arrived in the Himalayan nation to strengthen bilateral ties and trade. Mukherjee met top leaders of Nepal, including his counterpart Bidya Devi Bhandari and Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal. He laid emphasis on the stability and development of Nepal, which has witnessed political instability for long. Since the new constitution came into effect in September last year, Nepal has witnessed widespread unrest, especially violent protests by the ethnic Madhisi community, which has been demanding its rights in the new constitution. India has urged Nepali political actors to address concerns of all sections of society in the constitution. President Mukherjee also said Nepal can look at India's experience of constitution making. The, the message was that the Indian experience showed that uh, uh, an inclusive constitution that carried all sections of the people, where all stakeholders felt that they had a, uh, that their interests and uh, uh, views were uh, factored in. Uh, this this was uh, uh, this was an experience that. We felt Nepal could uh, perhaps uh, uh, look at uh, and uh, uh, we were very fully supportive of the uh, constitutional process that the present government uh, is, is uh, pushing. There have been frequent high-level visits between the two neighbours. Prime Minister Prachanda has visited India twice in the last four months. So has Nepali Foreign Minister Prakash Sharan Mahat. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi had visited Kathmandu twice in 2014. India is Nepal's biggest trade partner, donor and supplier of essential goods, as well as the only source of fuel for an impoverished country that is struggling to recover from two earthquakes last year that killed 9,000 people. This goodwill visit by President Mukherjee combines the bilateral with the larger regional subtext. To talk more on this, we are now joined by Ishwar Khanal, a journalist based in Kathmandu. Mr. Ishwar, how do you assess the outcome of Indian President Pranam Mukherjee's visit to Nepal? Uh, basically, when we talk about Indian President Pranam Mukherjee's visit to Nepal, for me that was you know, a sort of, what do you call it, uh, the message was, I think it was a very clear, very loud message because he was here at the invitation of Nepalese President Bida Devi Bhandari. And yes, uh, the visit, uh, in my terms, it was a success since he was here to mend the relationship between the, the two neighboring countries, you know. Uh, his visit is very, very significant as, at this juncture of time. How do you see the Indian president's engagement with the Nepal leadership and also with the Madhes leaders? This visit is a very good gesture on the part of our southern neighbor. Uh, in fact, you know, like President Pranam Mukherjee, back in, you know, when there was uh, the uh, Nepal's agitating parties, including the Maoist, and they uh, signed a 12-point agreement in India, New Delhi. And that was initiated by, you know, he was not the president that time, even though he was uh, the foreign minister. He initiated uh, this 12-point uh, agreement that was signed in New Delhi between the seven agitating parties and uh, the underground Sipian Maoist. So, in fact, I know uh, that uh, that sounds good when it uh, comes to you know his visit at this juncture of time. Now, with the flow of time, 
the agitating parties and after the promulgation of the new constitution in Nepal, the Madhesh based parties and some Janjati parties they are not satisfied with the constitution. Therefore, they are, uh, they are you know, uh, they are, they have been, so, uh, they have been disappointed with the way the, uh, you know, democratic parties or the constituent assembly, despite the fact that they were part of the constituent assembly, uh, they are not satisfied with the promulgation of the new constitution, saying that the demands have not been addressed in the new constitution. And with this, uh, you know, uh, what we can say, what we can see is, you know, Pranab Mukherjee's, since he is one of the uh, key major players or he took the initiative for the to open the agreement, his connection or his dialogue with the Madhisis, Madhisi parties and other political parties will definitely give a clear cut message that, you know, uh, there will be a sudden breakthrough in the near future. Thank you, Mr. Ishwar, for sharing your views. Now we take you to India's Jammu and Kashmir state where a young doctor, Sunia Wani, a doctor turned policewoman, has set a shining example for youth who wish to break stereotypes and pursue their dreams. <laughs> Taking a pledge to be loyal and true to the police service. A new batch of 17 officers joined Jammu and Kashmir police recently. As they marched at the passing out parade at Shere Kashmir Police Academy in Udhampur. However, Dr. Sunia Vani, the only woman in the 11th batch of deputy superintendent of police, stole the show. Dr. Wani also became the first woman Kashmir Police Service officer to be awarded the best all-round award for her performance during her over a year long training. It was my dream to join police force. So, it is not that the police force has no male officer who has been all-round best. So, when I was in the house, I was in the history of creating it. इससे पहले भी गवर्नर से जम्मू कश्मीर में मेडल ले चुकी हूँ मेडिसिन में टॉप करने की अल्लाह के फजल से इस बार भी ऑल राउंड वेस्ट आई हूँ तो एक लड़कियों के लिए एक एग्जांपल है कि किसी की वो अपने आप को किसी भी चीज से कम नहीं समझे आप बस काम करने की भावना होनी चाहिए और ऊपर वाले पर भरोसा तो हर कोई चीज पॉसिबल हो सकती है डॉटर ऑफ अ पुलिस ऑफिसर डॉक्टर वानी वॉज इंस्पायर्ड बाई हर फादर टू ज्वाइन द पुलिस सर्विस her success in turn will serve as an inspiration for many other girls in the state who wish to achieve something big in life. लड़कियों के लिए यही मैसेज रहेगा कि वो पढ़ें और अपने आप को कभी भी डेरोग्रेटरी फीलिंग नहीं लाएं कि हम किसी से कम हैं। अपने आप पे भरोसा रखें, आत्मविश्वास रखें, तो वो जरूर आगे अपनी मंजिल को हासिल कर सकती हैं। किसी से भी कभी भी हार नहीं मांगनी है। Dr. Wani has broken the shackles of biases and emerged a topper in all fields she has dabbled in so far. She hopes to serve her country with utmost dedication in her capacity of a police officer. People like Dr. Sunia are truly an inspiration. Now we move to Pakistan where the plight of Afghan refugees has become abysmal after the state introduced a new repatriation policy. Afghan musicians who have for years dedicated themselves to entertaining the people of Pakistan have also been asked to leave the country, putting their future at risk. Here's a look. Forty-year-old Zabit Khan, an Afghan national, dusts off his harmonium and begins to sing in his tiny office in Peshawar, Pakistan. Although he grew up here, soon he and every other Afghan living in Pakistan will be forced to leave under the government's newly enforced repatriation laws. Just like Zabit Khan, some 2.5 million Afghan refugees moved to Pakistan in 80s and 90s when instrumental music and public performances were banned in Afghanistan. The administration cracked down on musicians, arresting them and destroying their instruments, prompting them to flee their wanton homeland. 
In the past four decades, since then, the rich Afghan musical style has permeated Pakistani culture. Over the years, Afghan musicians have gained widespread fame from their lively performances and Afghan singers have become a common sight at weddings. But as the country's December 31st deadline for Afghan repatriation nears, the musicians face an uncertain future. According to UN estimates, more than half a million Afghans are returning home from Pakistan and Iran this year, stressing the government and aid agency who are preparing to provide help as winter approaches. Now we will take you to a unique celebration in India where devotees throw stones at each other to appease Hindu goddess of Par Kali. The festival has been celebrated for centuries with great enthusiasm. Take a look. Dancing on the beats of drums and fluids, these people have gathered to celebrate the famed Gotmar festival in Dhami village of India's northern Himachal Pradesh state. Devotees from different tribes are divided into two teams who then shower each other with stones until people start bleeding. The blood collected is then offered to Goddess Kali. However, instead of throwing stones directly, they are thrown with a parabolic trajectory in order to avoid any major injuries. इसकी एक मान्यता है कि पहले ये जो क्या बोलते हैं नरबली होती थी यहाँ पे और जब नरबली होती थी तो यहाँ पे जो एक रानी थी उसने यहाँ पे जब सती उसती होने से पहले उन्होंने यहाँ से किया कि दो खून कुछ खून दो बनाए जिसमें से एक कटेडू थे राजपरिवार थे तुंचू थे धगोई थे और दूसरी तरफ जमोगी थे तो उन्होंने ये प्रथा बंद करते हुए जो इसकी प्रथा थी तो बंद करते हुए इन्होंने आपस में एक खुंदों को एक खेल बनाया गया जिसे पत्थर का खेल कहते हैं और जो आज भी अच्छी तरह से मनाया जाता है और धामी के लोग इसे और आसपास के क्षेत्र के लोग इसे बड़ी आस्था से मनाते हैं Many foreign tourists also join the festival to witness this unique tradition. Gotmar has thrived within the confines of Dhami village and no outsider is allowed to participate in the festival. But the culture of India is amazing uh, and I am happy to celebrate with both of these clans to be here to participate. Um, I think I cherish the experience I've been getting from meeting Indian people and to beginning to learn a little bit about the culture and how deep and how rooted it is. Um, so I'm fascinated. Um, I admit I don't understand uh, entirely um, this celebration, but I've enjoyed the, the um, camaraderie, the, the competitiveness, uh, and the religious significance of what it means. This festival signifies the victory of good over evil and its celebration is believed to destroy the evil within. India is home to many such unique festivals which attract tourists and locals as well. With that we come to the end of this week's episode of South Asia Focus. Be with us again next week at the same time. Goodbye until then.